knowing what we know about M1, we can actually go ahead and build up the market for money, which is going to be denoted as the market for loanable funds. So here, take a look at the market for loanable funds. Loanable funds. And if you remember from the previous sort of chapter, loanable funds is just a really fancy way of us saying savings or money in general. So savings slash money. So here, when we talk about the market for loanable funds, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a supply and demand analysis that describes the financial market for saving and investment. So this is a model, a supply and demand model that describes, that describes the financial market, uh, financial market for saving and investment, saving and investment. So here, we just take a look at the market for money and see exactly who makes up the demand side, who makes up the supply side, and where our equilibrium is going to lie. And this is actually one of the stranger markets that we do take a look at because the savers and the demanders and the sort of borrowers, the savers and the borrowers, we can see we can actually see ourselves on both sides of the market. So the players, the entities that go on the demand side, that go on the supply side, they can actually find themselves on both sides of the market, both on the supply and demand side. So first of all, let's build up the supply side of the market. So this is the people that, these are the people or individuals that are actually putting money into the banks. They're saving money. And why do people save? Well, people are going to save for various reasons. They want to save for a rainy day. They want to have some type of buffer. But the main reward, the main reason why people want to save is to get, generate some type of interest. So the reward for saving is the interest rate. You and I want to put money into the bank in order to get some type of interest. Firms and corporations want to put money into the bank to get the same thing. And also the government themselves can find themselves on the supply side because they also do generate some type of interest by saving money. With all of this, we do know that the supply of loanable funds is positively related to the interest rate. So the higher the interest rate is, the more savings are going to take place within the economy, the more money we're going to be putting into the banks. So here on the savings side, on the supply side, it's going to be people like you and I, it's going to be firms and corporations, and also the government as well, because we can talk about both private and public savings under the market for loanable funds. On the demand side, why do people borrow? So people borrow to buy goods and services or to invest in capital. So you and I, we need to borrow money from banks. We need to take out loans in order to buy big ticket items, say like a car, a house. Maybe we need to take out some money in order to buy a refrigerator or just some type of electronics. Firms and corporations, they also borrow money in order for them to undertake some type of private, in order for them to take, undertake some type of project or some type of investment or to invest in capital, as we see right here. And also governments themselves, they need to borrow money in order to finance their deficits in order to undertake their particular actions. So on the demand side, we see the same three entities as well. We see people like you and I, we see firms and corporations, and we also see the government as well. As usual, the demand for loanable funds is going to be negatively related to the interest rate because the higher the interest rate, the less likely we are going to take out money from the bank. So here we have the typical upward sloping supply curve. We have the typical downward sloping demand curve. The hard part with all of this is seeing exactly who makes up the demand side and the supply side and the reasons they want to save and borrow money. So here, one of the stranger markets that we do take a look at because we can find ourselves on both sides of the market as well as firms, corporations, and the governments. However, the same typical supply and demand analysis that we've been working with this entire semester is still going to hold true. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at that. So here, a theme park purchasing capital such as a new roller coaster often relies on the market for loanable funds. So this is just an example of firms and corporations actually demanding money in order to undertake a particular project. So what does, this demand, what does this supply and demand model look like for the market for loanable funds? Here we go. We've already seen this so many times throughout the semester, so it is not nothing new to, it's nothing new to us in this sense. We can find out what our equilibrium interest rate is going to be. The price for the usage of money is the interest rate, so we put that on the vertical axis. And then the quantity of loanable funds, the quantity of money is going to be set on the horizontal axis. The single intersection between supply and demand is going to tell us our equilibrium interest rate, so 3% right here, and the equilibrium amount of funds, $300 billion in this case. However, we don't always have to be in equilibrium. We can get pushed out of equilibrium in a lot of different instances. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens in these cases. 
So with all of this, the same supply and demand analysis that we've been working with this entire semester still holds very, very relevant here. So just get a little bit extra practice with building up supply and demand. You have demand, we have supply, we have the interest rates right here. So interest rates are typically denoted with a lowercase r in economics. So anytime you see a lowercase r, it's going to be our interest rate. The quantity of loanable funds goes on the horizontal axis. And at point A right here, we said that this was equal to 3% interest rate and $300 billion of loanable funds. However, like we said, we don't always have to be working in equilibrium. So what happens if we're actually above our equilibrium interest rate, say at, a equal, at an interest rate of 4%? What is going to be emerging within the marketplace? So in the marketplace, we noted that we noticed that the quantity to demanded is going to be, say, maybe 200. We notice that the quantity supplied is going to be maybe, say, 400 here. So here, QS is bigger than QD. So if interest rates, in this case right here, if interest rates, interest rates are above equilibrium, are above equilibrium, equilibrium. So if anytime interest rates are above equilibrium, we notice that the quantity supplied of these loanable funds is going to be greater than the quantity demanded. So very high interest rates. We want to put more money to the banks and not a lot of people want to demand or take money away from the banks as loans. What particular economic situation emerges right here? The first thing that pops into your mind should be an excess supply, excess supply of funds. And an excess supply of funds, remember, is called a surplus. So there's too many, there's too much quantity of these loanable funds actually being put into the marketplace and not enough demand. So that just tells us that we are not in equilibrium. And once again, the marketplace is going to adjust. We have some type of invisible hand that's going to push us back to our equilibrium point at point A right here. So here, the we notice that, hey, there's too much too many uns right here. So the interest rate is actually going to get pushed down until we reach our equilibrium point where it's going to be exactly 3% and everything is fine within our little world. However, what happens if we go to the opposite case? Maybe we have an equilibrium interest rate equal to 2% or the, equal, the interest rate that's on the market currently is 2%. Then what's going to happen within the marketplace? So here at 2% below equilibrium, we just come to the opposite economic scenario. So if interest rates, if interest rates are below equilibrium, below equilibrium, that's where we have QD being bigger than QS. So QS, we'll say right here, or just put QD, QD bigger than QS. So we have a lot of people demanding funds. They want to take out loans, but not enough supply because not enough people are incentivized to put money into banks. We call this, remember, an excess demand, excess demand of funds. And the special name, of course, is a shortage. So we're a shortage of loanable funds in this instance. And once again, we can't be in the scenario forever. Interest rates will eventually get pushed up by market forces by the invisible hand, and we'll go back to our happy little place at point A where we reach our equilibrium. So once again, supply and demand analysis, things that we've been working with this entire semester are going to be holding true for the vast majority of markets that we do take a look at. Here in the market for loanable funds or the market for money, we still have this scenario, the same scenarios that we've talked about since the, in the beginning of the semester. So with all of this, what is the next thing that we can do with supply and demand that's where we go ahead and take a look at what is going to be affecting our supply curve shifting it over to the right shifting it over to the left and the same thing with our demand curve so what are the determinants of supply what are the determinants of demand and how exactly is that going to be affecting our equilibrium so once again supply and demand analysis just with a different market and we need to go ahead and take a look at the specific shocks within this particular market we'll go ahead and build all this up in the next few videos i'll see you guys there